Thank you, Dee. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anita Waters. I'm a member of the National Committee and the National Board of the Communist Party USA. And I've been a, a member of the party, well, I first joined the party in, in 1980 in response to Ronald Reagan's election. So I've been around the block. I haven't been a very continuous member, but I've been um, in the, in the last uh, 20 years or so I have been. So my topic today is uh, ruling class culture, a Marxist analysis. And um, I, I would say uh, ruling class culture maybe isn't the most common topic in Marxist schools, uh, but it's well worth examining in detail um, as we grapple with uh, new forms of struggle, uh, a, a, a bourgeoisie that has learned new tricks, um, and um, and a, an economy that is that is changing. Um, so the parties, uh, we have a party think tank, uh, which is a think tank on working class, uh, the working class in the United States. And it does concentrate on working class culture. Um, and this class focuses on the opposite. That is, what is the culture of the ruling class in the United States? How does it exert domination? And how can we fight against it most effectively? So I'll just give you a little roadmap about what we're gonna do. Uh, today. First, we'll uh, talk about what we mean by culture. Um, and by the way, I was a sociologist uh, for many years and, and studied anthropology as well. And you'll see that influence in my presentation on culture, of course. Um, and then we'll talk about who and what is the working class, what is a class and what who is the working class. Um, then we'll go into some of the cultural elements that shape the ruling class, that characterize the ruling class. And I'll ask for your input there too. And then finally, we'll 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 go through what what I have found in my research on uh, the culture of the ruling class. And then we'll look at what we can and must do um, to in the struggle to unite the working class so that we can overcome that ruling class uh, power. Um, so we'll uh, we'll stop about a third of the way in for some input uh, from listeners. So and then the, of course there will be time at the end for discussion and questions and comments. To be careful not to move these slides too quickly, but let's talk first about what is culture. Um, and in my research, I discovered one analysis of Lenin's concept of culture. Just after the victory of the October Revolution. Lenin called for a cultural revolution. He used the term culture in ways that are different than I'm going to be using them today. First, he used the word culture to, re, to uh, refer to material infrastructure. And here we might have a, a, a matter of translation from a, a Russian word that's being translated as culture. Um, for instance, part of the cultural revolution for Lenin was telegraph services and electrification. Uh, the second sense he used culture is one that we find today too, um, which is to refer to art and music and literature. Um, what do you do? You have culture. So, um, okay, am I? Can you hear me, Luke? I'm sorry, I'm getting a message. What was that? Uh, we okay. Hear, we hear you. Okay. All right. I just got a message. I thought it was. Um, that you weren't hearing me. Um, so the third sense of the term that Lenin, as Lenin uses it, is in political education. Um, so he meant uh, to to um, improve the culture of the the Russian people. And shortly after the revolution, uh, was uh, one of the things they did, which is similar to what they do in uh, did in after the 1959 revolution in Cuba which was a program of literacy training that used revolutionary texts. So it, it really killed two birds with one stone. It was, it was literacy training, building the capacity of uh, the working class and also uh, imparting political education. Now I'm gonna mostly use, it, use the word culture the way <clears throat> anthropologists use culture. Um, and really since the 1920s, uh, especially anthropologists have popularized the term culture to, to refer to the customs, usually of national groups, uh, the customs, language, technologies, morality, beliefs, um, and practices, anything that's passed down from one generation to the next generation in a specific geographic area, that's what they saw as culture. <clears throat> and we're, um, so anthropologists talked about national culture, the culture of the Chinese or 
uh, the culture of the Kwakiutl Indians in the Northwest Coast. Um, can we talk about culture as associated with class, as in ruling class culture and working class culture? Well, of course, both of our uh, members of both classes share the same language and many of the same customs, uh, but a Marxist approach would recognize that class position shapes the thoughts and ideas that individuals have. And by definition, um, a class determines the techniques with which one must eke out a living because of limited resources or abundant resources, depending on what class we're talking about. Um, I sometimes uh, turn to uh, uh, Afanasyev, um, who uh, was a uh, Soviet philosopher and critic of the bourgeoisie. Um, he used the concept, which might be useful in this case, social consciousness, and by which he included the aggregate of people's ideas, theories, on views, social feelings, and habits, and morals. Um, and he argued that with social consciousness, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat have a lot of uh, differences in their social consciousness. Um, and we'll get into his characterizations of the bourgeoisie uh, a little bit later here. Um, so now we have established kind of what we're meaning by culture. Let's talk about class. Now, class are groups of people who occupy the same relationship to the means of production. Um, and one of those classes, because of their position in the social economy, one of those classes is able to appropriate the labor uh, uh, based on, on, on of the other class. Um, and uh, we, we, I turn to our program to, to um, characterize, for characterizations of the US ruling class. The program said uh, the U.S. has, quote, one of the most controlling, entrenched capitalist ruling classes ever, concentrating enormous political, economic, and military power in the hands of a few transnational corporations led by global finance and the politicians who do their bidding. And even before the politicians who do their bidding, I would say the human beings who own and run those corporations. Um, they're acting as a class, uh, but it is composed of <clears throat> actual human beings. Um, okay, and further uniting the working class, um, they've done studies, people have done studies, network studies, uh, network analyses that show that um, they trace investments, board memberships, and intermarriages among leading business families. Um, and that is another indication of the unity of uh, the, the um, ruling class. Um, let's uh, talk about the 1%. The Occupy movement, I think it really have to be credited with popularizing the conception of the 1% versus the 99%. Wealth, of course, is very concentrated in our society. The top 1% owns almost 54% of the wealth and that's the highest it has ever been in, in human history. In fact, last year, the wealth of the top 1% increased by another $6.5 trillion, um, and that was driven mostly by financial markets. And of course, that leaves very little for the rest of us. Uh, the bottom 50% owns only 3% of the wealth. Um, so uh, it's um, while it is best to think about the ruling class as a collective social actor, um, cause it, it as a collective social actor, of course, it causes far more exploitation of the working class than any individual uh, does. But studies sometimes of the 614 or so billionaires in the United States um, are sometimes useful stand-ins for the culture of the ruling class. And the ruling class is composed of a tiny minority of individuals that really uh, that that own the vast majority of the wealth. And by the way, speaking of anthropologists, I've thought about anthropologists sometimes have written about the ruling class in the United States, and they sometimes uh, point to um, the way uh, the ruling class sometimes has customs that even more uh, resemble hunting and gathering societies, for example, than um, than uh, contemporary society. Um, so they, they have a lot of throwback kind of um, customs. 
But I, I have to imagine that if a 20, early 20th century anthropologist discovered a remote tribe somewhere of 100 people, say, um, and found of these 100 people, one of them controlled more than half of that group's wealth, that would be the most distinctive thing about that that group. That would be the thing that we would we would want to remark on and we would try to explain. And another thing I'd like to say about the 1% versus the 99%, I think these kind of formulations are really in sync with our party's broad um, and inclusive view of the working class. Um, if the working class is the broad majority, the ruling class is a small minority, and I think we should look at it that way. So those are some structural facts about um, the ruling class um, and uh, the consolidation of um, assets, the concentration of wealth. Um, but uh, what can we say about the customs of uh, the ruling class, their habits, uh, beliefs, and practices that are handed down by from one generation to the next? And I want you to think about this question. We're going to pause in a minute uh, for a little short uh, discussion period. Um, now, Marx and Engels uh, gave us um, some information about the, uh, the way um, ideas form in our contemporary society. Um, they said that bourgeois ideas come out of bourgeois production and bourgeois property. And the bourgeois and bourgeois jurisprudence is but the will of the bourgeoisie made into law for all. And bourgeois ideas seem to be so natural and permanent that the disappearance of bourgeois culture seems to the bourgeoisie to be the disappearance of all culture. Um, so I'd like to uh, pause. I thought we were going to be a third in, and this is what I'm afraid of, but maybe we have a, a little more than, um, well, we have some more time. But um, I'd like to, us to consider um, a couple of questions. What, what do you think of when you think of ruling class culture? Uh, that is, what do you think some of the uh, customs, technologies, habits, beliefs, and practices are that uh, the ruling class passes down from one generation to the next? And by the way, I have, because I'm so concerned about cause, talking about the ruling class as a, a united um, social agent in itself as a body, um, I, I, I changed a lot of they's to it's, you know, just to, to make it a singular class that we're talking about here. But, um, but I, I want to uh, open up the mic a little bit and give you guys a chance to uh, weigh in on what, it, what some of the elements of ruling class culture you notice. And let's keep our comments to, you know, a minute or so. And we'll, we'll take some time if you have some ideas um, and, you know, please do. Uh, so, Luke, I'll, I'll let you um, I'll turn it over to you to uh, to manage the hands and so forth. All right. So if you have a question, just uh, use the raise hand icon, uh, press that to raise your hand, at which point uh, I will call on you and open your mic on your end. All you've got to do is press the red uh, microphone icon, turning it green to open the mic on your end, at which point uh, you can pose your question or state your comment. I'm going to go ahead and call on uh, Corinna. Right now, I am unmuting you. Hi, Corinna. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Anita? Uh, 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 hi, greetings from Florida. And um, you know, I listen in to you and Joe every Friday religiously to Good Morning Revolution, and I enjoy all of you. But you. one thing about the ruling class also set also, I have found that the ruling class perpetuates itself by a kind of exclusivity and even educational elitism, you know, that if you don't go to Harvard, 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 or Brown, 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 you are kind of like subhuman. So there is a kind of, well, I mean, maybe this is more emotional than economic, a sort of a snobbish exclusivity, and even in education, trying to perpetuate their system by uh, allowing like only blue blood maybe with a few you know generosity like throwing pennies at the peasant scholarship but there is educational elitism among the ruling class 
and the bourgeoisie, and they also encourage a lot of consumerism to enrich in themselves through advertising that everybody has to kind of keep up with the Joneses so that they can ape in some way the bourgeoisie and what they have. Good, that, that, good. I'm done. All right, Thanks. thank you very much. Uh, next, I'm gonna go ahead and call on William. I am opening your mic now. William, just open your mic on your end, and then uh, you can state your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. All right. So um, the question was, what is rolling class culture? Um, I think it's everything from you know how uh, ideas about the way the system is structured are recreated, passed down, right? So that's not only education, just touched on briefly, but also our media. So the the TV shows we watched growing up, for example, like we have uh, what we now talk about as propaganda, which is uh, portraying the way the system works as they would like us to believe it's meant to work. Um, so that's policing or uh, what kind of job you're supposed to have growing up or what, what the purpose is uh, of life, <laughs> all that. So, uh, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to call on Darius next. Darius, I am opening your mic. Hi, Darius. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Um, okay. I think for me, ruling class culture has to do with its opposite. So what I tend to see more than a ruling class culture is a lack of working class culture. Um, a good hmm. example of this would be like, um, Oh, through all the sitcoms and things that we've had, Malcolm in the Middle was one of the first ones to actually portray middle class life. Um, and it's something that occurs in like all the medias at all the time. Um, so I think part of the consider part of what should be considered is the opposite. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. All right, we've got one more raised hand. That is Alexis. Alexis, I'm opening your mic now. Thank you, Luke. Um... So I agree with what Corinna said about um, this kind of constant overconsumption and waste as a cultural identifier. But I also wonder if some of the emotional disconnections and lack of empathy, uh, even leading down to control, could be something we could identify with the ruling class. For example, you know, we all know that tweet from Elon Musk about how we should just coup a country, which is you know, awful, but I, I digress. Um, yeah, those are my answers. Thank you so much. Good, oh, thank you. Thank you. Would you like to take one more, Anita? Sure, one more. Great. Oh, oh it looks like they actually put their hand down, so oh. we're good. Okay, changed their mind. So, um, well, thank you so much. That was really, um, that was really instructive. And uh, Corinna, we're going to talk about that what sociologists call the social reproduction social reproduction which is just you know in imagining uh classes reproducing themselves from one generation to the next and i'm definitely going to talk about education there um maybe it's even too late when it comes to harvard or 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 brown maybe you should have gone to choate or you know one of the other uh um fancy uh elite boarding schools uh for high school um, and that consumerism is an interesting thing that both Corinna and, and Alexis mentioned. Um, back when I first started um, studying this uh, phenomenon, there was uh, one of the things that uh, the ruling class had to learn how to do was hide their wealth. Um, and I, we don't see that emphasis on that so much anymore. Um, I think the, the uh, you know, instead the, um, what Thorstein Veblen called um uh conspicuous consumption uh is is more the 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 habits of of the ruling class today um and uh and uh Darius and William we, I I have um on my a few slides down, down uh something about TV shows and movies and that kind of thing too I think I think they really are um important in the way that we um we look at ruling class and what the ruling class tells itself about itself. So, um, so let's let's move on to what uh, what I found in my in my research on this on this question, which is um, 
one one of those places. Let's go back to uh, As uh, Asanasiev on um, on the bourgeois social uh, co um, uh, consciousness. Um, he wrote that uh, the bourgeoisie. This was in the 80s that he was writing. But he was writing from the Soviet Union, but he was talking about the bourgeoisie as a more more or less uh, stable category. Um, he said uh, the bourgeoisie's political ideas um, aim to sanctify and perpetuate capitalist wage slavery and prop up the decayed economic basis of capitalism. He said bourgeois morality aims to preserve the keynote of capitalism, that is private property and exploitation. The spirit of individualism, self-interest, the thirst for profit, hostility and competition make up the essence of the ethics of capitalist society. And even bourgeois art serves to divert the working class from the struggle against exploiters. And uh, Asanayev says, is employed to glorify the capitalist order of things. So um, let's, I, I have four um, different um, points to make about the customs of um, the uh, ruling class. We're first gonna talk about what it believes about class itself and what it believes what it believes about itself. What does it tell itself uh, about itself? Um, what it does, what it does makes profits. It, make, it hoards wealth and it foments antagonism in the working class. Um, so let's take the first one of these, and that's really what it believes. I, I think it's interesting what it believes about itself. And here we're going to go back to the uh, what uh, Corinna was talking about education. Um, but first, I'll say what they um, what um, that they talk about class as an essential category. And what this was was there was a study that looked at social class essentialism, which is defined as the idea that um, that class, uh, as well as biological categories like gender and race, and even cultural categories like religion and nationality, it sees these, essentialism sees these categories as natural, discrete, and stable. So stable over time, discrete, they're not like each other, and that they're, that it's a natural thing for this ha to happen, for these categories to form. Um, and these, these researchers found that the higher the social class of a person uh, who they were studying, the more essentially they viewed class. So higher, the ruling class is more likely to see class as an essential category, stable, discrete, natural. Um, and also they asked them about whether the world was a just place. And not surprisingly, the higher you go in the social class hierarchy, the more likely people are to say that the world is a just place. So they're happy. They feel like they get are getting what they deserve. Um, and this is also in sync with other more recent studies. Um, like uh, there was one in Scientific American that showed that the wealthy uh, have a compassion deficit. They they feel less compassionate for other people. They can't. No, they they have an empathy gap. They they can't put themselves in other people's shoes as easily as people from working classes uh, can. And now one of the the this book I have uh, here, um, this was one of the sources that has really influenced um, my ideas about the wealthy. And that was a this is a study <clears throat> from the 80s, I think, uh, of elite boarding schools and called Preparing for Power. Um, and the authors describe these schools as status seminaries uh, where the children of the wealthy obtain what they call a treasure trove of skills and status symbols uh, that tie them to the, their class. They're almost, they're almost uh, well, they're, they are um, brainwashed into being class, um, class warriors uh, for the ruling class. Everything about these schools tells the students, their students, that they are important people from important families, they're from the best families, and that they can look forward to lives as the next CEOs, politicians, and judges uh, wielding power in the nation. 
And even they, they did emphasize that these schools can be very demanding of their students. They can put them through ordeals. So students are made to feel that going through these ordeals of strict education makes them entitled, feel entitled to the comfortable life that they have ahead of them. Um, and framing power relations in moral authority, they convince themselves and, uh, and their students, of course, that their self-interest is identical uh, to the public interest. This is a phenomenon they call discipline self-deception. They are de deceiving themselves and they are made to believe that their, um, their interest, what's good for them, is good for, uh, for the United States as a whole. So that's an important thing about what, how they, what they make of their own, um, uh, um, their own success and their own inequality. And I'll add here a, another uh, sociologist that we uh, read a lot, um, who's not a Marxist and you know is often uh, posed as as opposing Marx, is Max Weber who wrote uh, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. But this is a point he makes in that, uh, in that text as well, that, um, that people who are very wealthy uh, in the United States, the Puritan ethic is what he's talking about, they see themselves as blessed, blessed with their, with their wealth. Um, so this is something that God has kind of uh, conferred on them um, and uh, I think this is a really strong belief among uh, the ruling class. It makes them feel good to believe this. Um, and uh, I, I never have used the word blessed uh, since uh, I have this perspective. Um, and I, one more thing about, uh, about preparing for power in the uh, elite boarding schools. Another thing those uh, boarding schools do is they throw their offspring into social networks with exclusively other wealthy children. And that helps ensure that what their own personal family wealth won't be compromised by the wrong marriages to uh, people outside their class. So uh, they practice, uh, and this is another thing that, I mean, as I said, soci anthropologists have often remarked on how uh, the customs of the ruling class are kind of throwbacks. And we have a concept called endogamy, that's when you when you marry within the class, within the group, that's endogamy. When you are forced to marry outside the group, that's exogamy. So, in our um, in our ruling class, the ruling class culture in the United States, and classes some tend to be endogamous, and um, of course, uh, gender is exogamous. There is a, a pressure to marry outside your gender. So, um, so that's what it tells itself. Let's turn to, uh, first of all, what they do, make profits. And here I, I like to um, remind, I'm always reminded of, um, of this great book uh, by uh, the author, I guess he's a New York Times business columnist, uh, about Jack Welsh, uh, the man who broke capitalism, how Jack Welsh gutted the heartland and crushed the soul of corporate America as if. Um, and how to undo his legacy. Um, this book doesn't uh, really deliver what it promises uh, in, the, um, in the subtitle, but it does give a, a really um, interesting picture of one person who kind of exemplifies ruling class approaches to this ultra ruthless profit making. Um, Jack Welch was CEO at General Electric for many years. Um, in the 80s and 90s, he exemplifies this ruthless pursuit of profit by firing workers, slashing union density, bullying his employees, merging with and acquiring other companies, employing shady accounting and reporting methods, and expanding the finance division. Uh, when he started with GE, the finance division was $11 billion. When he finished uh, uh, some years later, it was $370 billion. Um, and of course, he gutted, he gutted the, the, the um, General Electric. He didn't leave much uh, uh, to say behind him. But um, thanks to uh, the Ronald, uh, the Reagan administration rollback of regulations, uh, GE under Jack Welsh spent billions in um, 
stock buybacks, uh, which enriched shareholders and, of course, the top executives. Uh, Jack Welsh himself uh, got rich, um, very rich, and a, a huge settlement when he left the company. Uh, the, program, the increased productivity of workers uh, went directly to the penthouses and private airplanes of investors, while workers' wages stagnated at General Electric. And of course, the worst practices of the period were the massive layoffs, uh, decline in union density, as I said, offshoring, uh, shareholders first, and everybody else be damned, and the further entrenchment of finance capital. I'll just explain that rank and yank idea. Um, when uh, Jack Welsh started at um, GE, he'd have each division would have to rank their employees, and then he would just summarily lay off the, the bottom 10% of or 30% or 50% of whatever that list was. So it was a very, it was a, it was a difficult uh, time uh, for those uh, folks. Um, it, it, before Jack Welsh became uh, CEO, GE had been known as Generous Electric and it had very good worker-centered policies, but uh, Jack Welsh did change that. Now, of course, Jack Welsh didn't break ca capitalism. We know capitalism is in the process of breaking itself. And he wasn't unique in what he did uh, in GE. That that kind of a process was going on in many corporations and is still going on and was really enabled by the Reagan administration nationally. So um, so we're still seeing that, that impact uh, today. Um, and of course, how to undo his legacy, what, what Gellis offers us in this book is not much, but kind of, um, you know, we hope they feel a little better and we like the guy who runs Patagonia and, you know, he, he cherry picks a couple of um, a couple of uh, those corporations that have um, something that we agree with uh, in uh, to say for themselves. So um, let's go to that third one, and that is what the ruling class does. It hoards wealth and it protects wealth. Um, a Boston, and they're never satisfied either, a Boston College survey from 2011 uh, surveyed extremely rich American households whose average net worth was $78 million, and it revealed that multimillionaires generally are not content. They're not happy with their fortunes. One respondent said he wouldn't really feel secure unless he had a billion dollars uh, to his name. Now, there are always outliers. We talked about Frederick Engels uh, at, on GMR yesterday. Um, one of these is Chuck Collins. Uh, he's the great grandson of Oscar Mayer. Um, Chuck Collins in, inherited a fortune and he gave it all away uh, in his 20s uh, to social justice organizations. Um, then he wrote this book, Wealth Hoarders How Billions, Billionaires Are Spend Millions to. Uh, hide trillions. And he really uh, defines the wealth defense industry, which is uh, uh, tens of thousands of uh, people, accountants and, um, you know, uh, lawyers. Um, and they help the rich use shell companies, um, uh, offshore accounts and trusts and other uh, ways of protecting their wealth. And here's a little uh, cartoon from there. Um, philanthropy is, uh, it, it seems like it's a, um, it's kind of a, a chance to um, exercise power in a, a different way. Just like uh, we have to compare the ruling class to, uh, you know, a hunting and gather, gathering societies, the Northwest Coast Indians have a famous ceremony called the potlatch, where, where two uh, tribes who are in competition with each other, they get together and whichever chief can give away the most um, wins, basically. And just like these potlatch ceremonies, um, the American rich exercise power by giving resources away. Philanthropy uh, offers both social accolades and tax write-offs, which are convenient. So this little, um, you know, uh, cartoon sh shows that tr give a little bit, tiny portion of your stolen wealth 
um, to or start your own nonprofit, and now your reputation is clean and you've sa saved uh, money on taxes. So um, that's uh, hoard hoarding and protecting uh, wealth. Now this is a little bit more involved, and that is what it does. It the ruling class really tries to divide the working class. Um, it tr it tries to drive wedges. Uh, between segments of uh, the working class. Um, first, as our program uh, argues, racism provides hundreds of billions of in extra dollars into capitalist pockets every year uh, due to the unequal pay that racially oppressed workers receive for comp work of comparable value. And this, in turn, drives all wages lower, of course. Some of this is due to structural racism, uh, which in which racist intentions of the past are baked in to laws and regulations and practices that disadvantage people of color. And racism hides behind these seemingly colorblind rules. But, uh, uh, and one of them would be, say, um, uh, Kevin McCarthy wanting to change uh, the rules uh, that people have to follow in order to get food stamps. Um, this uh, disadvantages people of color disproportionately, but it's a colorblind, uh, you know, oh, it affects everybody. Um, so, but, uh, so much of it is color, colorblind, uh, and uh, some of it is um, institutional or structural racism, but in the post-Trump era, a lot of this racist um, uh, racism um, is deliberate and blatant, um, and that includes police violence, for example, making people of color feel unsafe. So the second example is sexism. The ruling class uses um, uses uh, gender, uh, wants to divide the working class by gender, whether men and women, or straight people and uh, gay people, or straight and uh, trans. Um, and, and in, in some cases lately, uh, with uh, abortion bans and, uh, and uh, arguments against uh, that, that really try to make uh, life impossible for trans people, um, they're subcontracting their dirty work to fundamentalist Christians who want to ban abortion and even birth control, and they want to en enforce strict gender regulations against the queer and trans communities. Um, being unable to control what happens to one's body uh, is a huge disadvantage in the workplace. And that gives men, actually cis men, I guess we could say, what Du Bois might have called a wage of maleness um, and uh, sets groups of workers against each other, um, dividing the working class. And finally, uh, or of course, it's never final, but another example is the ruling class works to divide the working class by class. And you wonder, how can that possibly be? Um, well, what the ruling class does is it perpetuates a myth that there's not one broad working class, but that there are blue-collar workers and college-educated workers and professionals and managers, and all of these are distinct classes according to this myth. Um, now we we do recognize the petty bourgeoisie, the the, the small business owners or um, highly uh, uh, salaried uh, workers. Now by giving the petty bourgeoisie the idea that they might one day join the ranks of the rich, the ruling class makes alliances or tries to make alliances uh, with the petty bourgeoisie um, and join have them join the upper ruling class. To, uh, to fight against the working class and to keep the working class um, suppressed. And we saw that phenomenon, I would say, at work on January 6, 2021. Um, small business owners and minor professionals were overrepresented among the insurrectionists. And of course, uh, the ruling class never sticks by you. Uh, the um, the uh, petty bourgeoisie uh, insurrectionists are the ones who are paying for it so far, at least not Roger Stone and uh, Donald Trump. Now, one thing that I wanted to go back to what um, William and, and Darius were saying, I think one of the ways what uh, that the ruling class tries to 
seduce or to lure the small business owners and the high salaried workers into siding with the ruling class instead of with the broader working class is through the arts. And when I started, of course, I was working on this presentation this week. So of course, folks were telling me about Succession, uh, the television show that was very popular and uh, that just concluded. Um, and of course, Succession is not the first portrayal of the very wealthy. Television audiences consume lifestyles of the rich and famous, Dallas, uh, and countless others. In fact, you people, uh, those of you who have televisions and watch, uh, consume uh, more television than I do, probably know better. Um, but the perennial uh, trope is the rags uh, to riches story. Um, and I think that was kind of reflected in succession, although I wasn't paying as close attention to that program as maybe I should have. So um, we want to move, um, I, I wanna move to what can be done uh, now, but you might have questions from this part and hold on to them. We'll entertain them all at the, at the end. I just have um, a little bit more to talk about, and that is, what what can we do about this? What shall we, uh, I mean, now that we know something about what the ruling class uh, cultural, uh, you know, uh, projects are, how can we uh, argue about them? All right, so I have three uh, possibilities here. One is um, we've got a demand that the members of the ruling class pay what they owe. Um, and it's not even their fair share, it's what they already owe to uh, the people of the United States. We, uh, we share, uh, the idea of our government is that we share our resources, some portion of our resources, in order to, um, to uh, pursue projects for the public good, public education, uh, roads and infrastructure, um, uh, the welfare of uh, the neediest people, the, the most um, dependent people. I remember uh, Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton in the 90s saying, we have to, you know, uh, we, we have to overcome dependency. There's always gonna be dependency. Uh, you know, human beings are, aren't born able to go out and get a job um, on their own. So they, we really need uh, them to, you know, pay what they owe. Um, and I want to talk a bit about that ProPublica analysis uh, of billionaires' tax records in 2021. That showed that the 25 richest Americans paid a tax rate of about 3.4% on their income, while the median American household, which, you know, the median income is 51000 a year, that median American household uh, paid 14% of their, their annual uh, wages in federal taxes. According to Forbes, those 25 people even saw their, uh, uh, from the period of uh, 2014 to 2018, that same group of 25 people saw their collective worth rise $401 billion in those five years alone. And on that, they paid 13.6 billion in, in federal income taxes. And they're always saying that's a big number. Yes, it's a big number, but it's a 3.4 percent. And of course, the 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 uh, these are are stolen wages to begin with. If they had paid the median tax rate 14 percent, the U.S. Treasury would have an extra extra 42.4 billion dollars. Um, and you can do a lot of you can satisfy a lot of human needs uh, with 42.4 billion dollars. But of course, if they pay what they really owe it would be way more than that. Um, and the second strategy is to find and exploit points of disunity in the ruling class. We're turning their strategy against them and taking advantage of points of disunity in the ruling class. Um, and by fighting for issues uh, such as, um, well, by fighting for issues as the working class, we're fighting for issues and we can ally ourselves with some segment of the bourgeoisie. And I, I use the, the, the phrase woke corporations, which is Ron DeSantis's favorite phrase um, yesterday, but meaning it in a different way. Um, 
if if we do have a broad uh, broad coalition that includes even segments of the ruling class, and we win a victory, that doesn't that doesn't hurt the ruling the working class. That instead leaves the working class stronger and more united for the next struggle. Um, in uh, limited, according to our program, in limited instances, the capitalist class. Uh, oh, sorry. In limited instances, splits in the ruling class appear and the less reactionary segments of the capitalist class will join the fight against the more backward sections. So one of the one example of this is the um there are corporate there are banks that were um pressured to stop uh, lending money to the oil and gas uh businesses, oil and gas corporations. And in turn uh, so that those were our woke uh, corporations in in question here. They're they're supporting uh, change in climate uh, policy uh, by just withholding their uh, lending to oil and gas uh, companies. In turn, the the state legislatures, I think of Texas and Tennessee and maybe other states as well, have um, punished those banks by saying all of our our money that we have in um, you know, uh, uh, pension funds, for example, we're going to pull them out of those banks that are woke because uh, they're they're not doing what we want to to them to do. So that kind of that's a that's a, a point of disunity in the in the ruling class, and we have to take advantage of that and uh, drive that wedge. Um, and finally, we have to disabuse them of their myths about themselves at every opportunity. And the ideas of the ruling class, Marx and Engels told us, are the ideas of the age. But I, I think there are other ideas. There are resistant ideas. There are um, alternative um, perspectives um, that are expressed. Um, for instance, uh, I study historical narratives. And there are um, historical, and it's a very hot topic right now, too. Um, historical narratives that are that are put forth by the ruling class uh really you know value do what exactly what as and i have said they do they really glorify uh capitalism but we could promulgate honest historical narratives and challenge the entitlement of the ruling class at every chance uh we have to be critical of the way that class is portrayed on television and in movies um and uh, we also have to expose the cruelty and sadism and racism and sexism behind cuts in food stamps and Medicaid, like the ones Kevin McCarthy and his party demanded. Um, and uh, and um, we have to move. Uh, we have to just challenge that at every uh, at every point. And I think the arts. Well, the arts, uh, well, Asim Nagayev said the arts were really um, usually used in, in service of capitalism. I think arts can be, uh, can be resistant. Um, and I think that is one of the places where we can, through uh, art, music, and literature, um, challenge some of, those, um, some of those perspectives. Um, do I have our annual, our goal? I didn't write that. Yeah, our ultimate goal, just to remind us. Um, this is from the program too, uh, is for uh, the working class to form a revolutionary majority uh, based on mass organizations and political parties. We have to organize ourselves within the, the class too um, and must work to make it politically impossible for the former ruling class to use political or military means to return to power. The bourgeoisie, of course, they don't want to. They can't eradicate the working class. They're what they're depending on the working class to do the work. But the working class can and should want to eradicate the bourgeoisie as a class, which would be the end of capitalism. Now we're not going after people, um, personally, uh, much as um, although we do offer people at our our table a chance to punch a, a punching bag that looks like Jeff Bezos. Um, we shouldn't do that, really. We 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 have to accept in fun, I guess. Um, but we have to uh, we have to recognize that what we hate about the bourgeoisie is its existence as a class. Um, so I uh, I know it's only ten minutes to two, but I want to turn it over to our final questions. Um, 
I want to ask you, what are some of the other ways that the ruling class tries to use race, gender, and class to foment antagonism uh, from one segment to another? And how can we maybe overcome that? And what are some other strategies uh, to weaken the ruling class? And I want to open up the mic and I, I will come back and, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, summarize us. We uh, probably won't go all the way to 2.30, but we'll, we'll have some time to enjoy our Saturday afternoon then. Um, but, but I'm really interested in how you're going to answer these couple of questions, because I know I couldn't find just one place to look for the answers to these things. I think that it really takes some um, big picture thinking. So um, I'll turn it over to you, Luke, for your um, all right. guidance Thank you here. Very much. <clears throat> Laura, um, I'm unmuting you. If you will unmute yourself and uh, ask your question or comment, just uh, press the microphone icon to open your microphone so that we can hear you. All right, um, we'll come back to you in a moment, Laura. Um, I'm going to call on Raven. Raven, I am unmuting you now. Hello? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Um, how was reading uh, Russian propaganda, uh, Russian gay propaganda law? And that seems where uh, DeSantis is getting his, um, about banning books and uh, the hate towards drag queen uh, reading book days and stuff like that hmm. need to because uh, I, I, I was looking at Putin all his uh, policies and stuff and I think that's where if the guy if the people would see that that's the what where this is coming from they might have a, a different opinion hmm and that's all I have thanks Thank you very much Okay. Um, Lowell, I am opening your mic now. Hey, Lowell. Aloha, Anita. Um, great presentation. Um, I wanted to focus on the second question. The, um, I mean, that I can't go without making a comment about the other ways ruling class tries to use um, um, use us against each other. And it's, to me, it's just, you know, representation. So we get lured into you know, the Oprah's or, you know, lots of examples or enough examples for us to think, okay, we can get there when it's sort of like the basketball metaphor I used to use when I was a school teacher. And I would tell my mostly male students who were aspiring to be NBA players that something like, you know, a tenth of a fraction of a fraction make it that far. So it's, it's, a, it's a mirage. Um, as far as strategies, obviously it's to weak, it's to strengthen um, strategies to weaken the ruling class. I mean, it's to strengthen the working class. And I would like to hear from you what you know. Right now, we have these quote unquote culture wars and you know, the book bannings and the um, going after teachers and librarians and um, um, Black Lives Matter history and curriculum and all these are very forefront and they have you know, varying degrees of movement mobilized against them. I really would like to see the same kind of vigor and anger and mobilization around just working class attacks, um, that kind of intolerance. And what, can we do that? How can we do that? Um, this recent Supreme Court ruling um, was ho horrific. Um, I would like to have seen that kind of mobilization against that. Um, so I'm curious of your thoughts, how we can make that kind of movement happen. Thank you. Thanks, Lowell. Very much, all right. Um, Laura, we're gonna try you again. Uh, I just, uh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, my apologies. I My computer's not working right. Uh, I wanted to address the second question. One of the strategies would be to demand a reduction in the military budget because mil the ruling class makes a ton of money off that, uh, um, you know, through making armaments. 
and also reducing the financialization of our economy because I think that's where a lot of the new wealth is coming from as opposed to say making cars it's really out of making money off money and we need to get back to a really strong Frank Dodds or even during FDR's time where we started to really relic <coughs> excuse me regulate Wall Street and then I guess the third way someone alluded to it is making the working class stronger you do that by increasing class consciousness and that's the question how do you increase class consciousness among the workers that they know their place in their class they know what the relationship is between them and the ruling class and um, I think the big one of the main reason ways of doing that is to involve them in just basic struggle because people learn through struggle um, although I would love to have show this uh, presentation to every worker in the world <laughs> and that would help too thank you for a wonderful presentation thank you Laura all right uh, Carol I am opening your mic if you'd like to open it on your end and present your comment there you go are you speaking we can't hear you All right. Um, looks like there's some kind of difficulty there. Apologize for that. I'm going to call on Alexis. Unmuting your mic now. Thank you, Luke. Um, gosh, I had <laughs> had a couple thoughts, and then they all seemed to disappear right when I got asked. Um, I guess one of the things that I've kind of been thinking a lot about lately, in terms of uh, class divisions that are being perpetrated within the working class is specifically the working class, how they exist in our current generation, where it's not necessarily just industrial workers. Now it's kind of expands a whole breadth. You could even include the administrative classes in that. Um, but the division between that formation of the working class as it exists now and the formation of the peasant class they are our number one ally and i feel like i've seen more and more lately this push in standard media of a division of a um kind of degrading like further degrading of the peasant homeless class so um i guess that's something to pay attention to but i don't really have any further comments past that thank you thank you very much um would you like one more question, Anita? Sure, one more would would be great. And All then we right. guess we'll close a little early, but I've, but go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm gonna call on Ugo. I'm opening your mic now. Thank you. Um, yeah. So uh, talking about strategies to weaken the ruling class. Um, well. I've been thinking about identifying the strategies that the working class uses uh, against us, and a major one seems to be to control the actual physical structure of our communities and the spaces that we have the opportunity to gather in and be in community with one another. There are almost no third spaces in this country anymore for people to gather and talk to each other and just be in fellowship. Um, but that also creates an opportunity for us because people are starving for these spaces and, and services that can be coordinated from them. Um, and so we can seriously undermine their power and influence in our communities by identifying places where we could build out these spaces uh, for for anybody to come and just be be without having to buy something or being yeah being corralled into uh, shops or some kind of commercial space or being corralled um, back into their homes and, and and forced to consume media that they control. Um, we need to create a third space that not necessarily we control, although we should to make sure that it's not just so that it doesn't become hijacked by the ruling class, but that just empowers people in our community um, 
to to be in community with another and we can coordinate uh, a lot of services that people are hungry for and desperate for like child care um art spaces uh community libraries or education union organizing spaces uh recreation uh clubs in in, in the community uh even create like a wellness spa type thing if we can do this and have this kind of presence in our communities that will immediately put us in between the working class and the ruling class if they can see us providing value and these services and stuff that everyone needs they will immediately see that we are on their side that we are providing for their for their need or allowing them empowering them to provide for their needs you know i i think it's essential that we figure this out hmm. thanks Sh shall i you have any more raised hands luke yeah there's a few more um let me see here uh darius oh did i already call on darius uh not this time there you go Darius, your mic is open. All right. Um, I will go ahead to Yazoo. I'll try this one more time. Uh, you're unmuted, Yazoo. Just there you go. Hey, Luke, am I, am I speaking? Yep. Sweet. Yeah, gotcha. um, one thing I wanted to remark on is how the ruling class basically creates illegal and semi-legal groups of people um mm. basically in, in essence a loop of, a lupin proletariat a they might they might start some sort of uh political struggle in some in a country in the global south and if you notice there's always one going on um that people are trying to flee and they and they come here and find adverse uh immigration laws that aren't to their favor and basically create a underclass of people um also through the through the use of some of those colorblind laws that you were talking about entire swaths of people are semi-legal in a way so whenever the whenever the working class does or if it does finally achieve this consciousness or when it does rather um you're always going to have a line of even more disadvantaged people waiting to scab in their place mm -hmm. true Okay, thanks. All right. Um, yeah, there you go. Okay, that's it. All right. Well, thank you so much. This was really uh, rich, um, and I took notes, and I'm going to try to figure, um, maybe put some of these in a in a final document. I'll start at the um, at the very uh, end there. Yazoo, I agree that immigration laws are, are some of those supposedly colorblind. Well, of course, they're not even colorblind, but that, that's true. The, um, the structures that, that uh, divide the ruling class um, are, are things that we need to fight against at every opportunity. Um, and um, a lump in proletariat, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't call them lump in, they haven't done any, they're not preying on the working class. Um, they're, um, they're just working class people who, who are, are you know, fleeing these horrible situations that the U.S. and other imperialists have created in uh, South and Central America, for example, um, and they're trying to get by and and uh, protect their families and and uh, and support their families. Um, so that was a really good point. Whole groups of illegal and semi-legal people. Um, Hugo, you mentioned the physical structures, and I think this is a really interesting question. I um I know. Uh, People just, as sociologists especially, because we're so concentrated on people, we kind of overlook spaces sometimes. But I was always struck by uh, the spaces in Havana, for example, that have been built in order to have huge um, uh, demonstrations or huge, huge protests. The, uh, my favorite is the anti-imperialist plaza that's in the, uh, across the, the street from the um, U.S. Embassy. And that was a, a site of, you know, um, 
medical school graduations, uh, protests over Ileon Gonzalez being, uh, you know, held in, in the United States, many, many of those um, issues. I, I thought about it too when we're trying to get um, a, an amendment on the ballot in uh, Ohio here. And when it comes to trying to find a, a public space in order to gather signatures, that's harder and harder. We would like to spend, be right there out, out of the front doors of Walmart, for example, but that whole parking lot is a private um, private property and you'd have to stand in, in near where the, um, the, the cars drive into the driveway in order to be on a public street. So privatizing every inch of uh, what we have is another one of those examples. Um, and that's a really interesting, it's always really interesting to take a spatial look at what's going on. Um, Alexis, you talked about uh, class division. I, I agree that the administration or, or administrative jobs, white collar jobs are, are said to be different than, uh, than blue collar jobs. You mentioned the peasant class, and I'm not sure what you mean by that, I, because I think Peasants, in or at least for me, has a very specific meaning, and that is um, small farmers is what they would call them in in the Caribbean. Small farmers, uh, that is, farmers that have baby subsistence uh, um, um, farms, uh, or or you know a, a few crops and enough to keep one um, uh, living, or especially through the through the 1800s, especially after uh, after slavery ended in in uh, in the Caribbean, um, homeless people is a different is a different story. So um, I don't know. I, I I would have to think about um, about that uh, question. But the, you're right. These these divisions are are in a lot of these um, cases. And as far as um, I mean, I could relate what Alexis said about uh, administrative people being separated to what Laura said about increasing class consciousness through struggle. And I think, for instance, doctors. Um, when I was uh, growing up and looking at um, at, at uh, inequality in America, uh, one of the things we used to talk about was, you know, how I said with preparing for power, the ordeals that people go through make them feel entitled to benefits down the road. And that's what people who have studied um, medical schools uh, have said this grueling uh, residency that they put people through that gives people the idea that they won't have to that that they deserve the uh, three or four hundred thousand dollar salary that they'll uh, get when they come out. But of course, what what really will make doctors recognize that they in fact nowadays are part of the working class too is that workers uh, doctors are striking in some places. They have been so bureaucratized and subsumed under these profit-making um, institutions that they have recognized their own place in the working class. So that would increase um, uh, working class consciousness. I agree also financialization uh, of the economy. Uh, this really seems to be an underlying uh, strength. This is where where the uh, the the upper the very ruling class that we're talking about um, is is sucking its strength out of the out of the United States is through the finance uh, industry and regulation of banks would be a, a start of that. And you're right, reduction of military budget is something I didn't mention and I I could have. It's it's uh, I I know that there's. Um, for every thousand dollar, for every four hundred and fifty dollars, I think they spend, you know, on salaries for or, or pay to um, members, ordinary members of the military. Uh, the all of those, those is four hundred and fifty something million, I guess. But uh, for every four hundred and fifty we spend on on those people, we spend a thousand dollars on big military contractors. So those defense uh, industry, the defense contractors, they are getting uh, the lion's share of that uh, of that budget. Um, okay, uh, going back to what Lowell said, um, uh, I like the idea of it as a mirage. The mirage of of wealth is just around the corner if I work a little harder or um, if I get lucky, um, or maybe if I, if I say the right prayers, uh, for example. Um, and you're right, the strategy is to strengthen the working class through, um, through struggles. 
um, it's hard uh, to know what to do about these culture wars, book banning. And Raven pointed out that this is a this is a playbook from even Putin. I think the trouble is um, the the right wing and fascist uh, tendencies have become internationalized. Uh, we have Steve Bannon over there in France or wherever trying to get everybody in 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 line uh, around the world on on the same kind of thing. So it's not surprising to me that they're they're well they are all. I mean Putin, I'm sure. Uh, in Russia, there's an anti-trans, um, anti-gay um, movement, um, and of course, uh, lots of anger around um, around this uh, these culture wars like book banning and um, and uh, uh, SCOTUS de decisions. So, um, yeah, I, I think I, I think I've touched on. It. Uh, what most people have said, and it was really very fruitful. I, I, as I said to begin with, I'm not sure I have really concentrated or or thought about this in a broad enough way, um, since we don't usually talk about ruling class culture. But um, but it, we do have to be cognizant of the way that they are are um, trying to uh, um, um, the the way they are are passing on their um their advantages and their like uh, uh with um the social reproduction making sure that their offspring have certain educational advantages such that they don't have to compete against the brightest of the working class youth the brightest of the working class youth won't have access to enough enough opportunities to to become fully uh fully uh functioning or fully to, to reach their fullest pot potential as human beings. So I, I'm, I'm glad to have had the opportunity to teach this class I, or to um, give you some ideas. I, I hardly even call it teaching, but I, 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 it was an opportunity for me to look into some, um, some sources that I haven't really thought about in relation to a Marxist analysis of, um, of the ruling class and ruling class culture. And um, I thank you, and I thank Dee, and thank you, Luke, for um, helping uh, me through the, the, the technical aspects. So thanks. Okay. Thank you, Anita. Uh, we will continue this exploration. You, you, you got us off to a good start in uh, trying to uh, understand this class force that sits on our shoulders or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so or we next. Yeah, yeah, we will continue to explore uh, and we thank you for your contribution. So everyone, please join us for the next class, which is Tuesday night. We have classes coming up Tuesday night, Thursday night, and uh, two more classes on Saturday. Uh, this is, uh, we hope to see you uh, again. And we thank everyone for their participation and we invite you to encourage others to join in uh, for the uh, next uh, several sessions that we have. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Anita, very much. Uh, and thank you everyone for your contribution today. We hope you'll continue to participate going forward. Thank you, good, good afternoon. Bye,